going to introduce um, Des and Nino. So Jessica Ram trained at Duncan of Jordan's College of Art and Design, Dundee, uh, specializing in mechanical sculpture. And in 2014, she trained at Edinburgh College of Art where she studied printmaking, material culture and sculpture positioned within alternative economies. Her current projects include commissions to bring Lumiere sculptures into, into public spaces and a printmaking stunt riding performance working with a group of Glasgow based BMX riders. She's also part of an ongoing research collaboration titled Carpet Territory, which explores fears of physical and ethical contagion. These fears flow from an awareness of the proliferating struggles associated with late capitalism and inherent contradictions we face while trapped in modes that command our complicity. Recent exhibitions include Buckethead Whiteout Scenario at Glasgow School of Art in 21, Tazara Lyons Sustran Cycle Passage Johnston 2021, and Extraordinary Popular Delusions at the Shopping Centre Paisley 2019, Cena 3 Intersections Glasgow Women's Library 2019, from A to Z back again at BC Institute New York 2019, as well as solo presentations at Earth Thrive at Tramway, Glasgow. 2015 and personal structures platform Easter House at Glasgow International in 2018. And I'm delighted that Edinburgh Printmakers is presenting a solo exhibition of Jess Ram's work in Gallery 2 at present. It's called Stumbling Blocks now and it's open until 12th of November. And Nuno Sacramento is a Mozambican born Portuguese curator and is the director of Peacock Visual Arts in Scotland. Between 2010 and 2016, he was director of the Scottish Sculpture Workshop. He's a graduate of the Apple Foundation Amsterdam. He has a PhD by practice in visual arts and shadow creating from Duncan and Jordan's University of Dundee. In 2010, after introducing shadow curating to Devon Arts, he co-wrote Artocracy with curator Claudia Zesk. In 2015, Nuno and collaborator Brett Bloom organized Camp Breakdown Scotland co and co-wrote Deep mapping. More recently, through his work at Peacock, Sacramento set up the Worm Gallery dedicated to printing and publishing and visual arts and underground cultural activity, where he co curated Another World is Possible with Aberdeen People's Press in 2021 and ran Scotland's first fully funded curatorial fellowship in 2021. Nuno you know, has so organised many projects such as Maker's Meal, Scotland, Portugal, Brazil, Slow Prototype Skills Biennale Art Cup. Portugal, Serbia, Finland, and Scotland, besides to name but a few. Nuno is a member of IKT International Association of Curators of Contemporary Art and sits on the boards of Scottish Art, Contemporary Art Network and, and SOS RTPT. So I am delighted that you're both with us this evening. I'm really interested in this conversation. Um, I'm going to disappear now um, and let you um, get on with it. Um, so, you know, I'm going to hand over to you um, and I'll rejoin you uh, towards the end of this conversation. Thank you both. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Janet. Thanks, Edinburgh Printmakers, for, for this invitation. It's a, a great pleasure and an honour to be talking to uh, Jess. Um, we've, we've known each other uh, now for, you know, about three years. We started discussing the possibility of working together uh, in a project around performance art uh, in Aberdeen uh, just before the pandemic. And as the pandemic hit, uh, plans changed, but uh, I was I continued very, very interested in Jessica's work. And when I received the invitation to have an in-conversation with uh, Jessica, I uh, accepted uh, immediately. Um, this is going to be an informal conversation. I mean, Madrid at the moment, uh, traveling, uh, Jess is in Glasgow uh, during COP26. Um, I'm not sure whether where, where the, the audience uh, are, but it might be many places across Scotland and beyond. Um, not everyone will have had the chance to see the exhibition. I, I haven't seen the exhibition other than through uh, images, videos, uh, and some screenshots. Uh, very, very curious about, but I would like to start um, just to uh, gather some information around your background, uh, Jess. I mean, I, you know, like, like myself, you know, people, uh, if they just hear us, they don't really, our accents, you know, we, we, are, we are difficult to trace. So uh, tell us a little bit about that, uh, just, just briefly. 
Sure, the accent question is a really important one in Scotland, isn't it? Like um, everybody wants to be able to place you. Unfortunately, I can't place myself, so it's a bit of a challenge. <laughs> um, my accent, I suppose, is part Scottish, part English, part New Zealand, potentially, because I have one parent who's from New Zealand uh, and I'm from a background which is a relatively alternative, like uh, I was born in a squat in London. So my parents were part of quite a big community of radical people back then. But the issue with that was, um, it was quite a sort of abrasive community to grow up in. There was a lot of uh, police harassment going on. And for whatever reason, my parents chose to move to a really remote part of Scotland uh, north of Dundee. So I, I grew up most of my life in a rural farming community just north of Dundee. So you can imagine it's quite a, a an interesting cultural rubbing up against each other kind of thing. It, it's very much a monoculture there in terms of how people farm the land, but also the diversity is just nil. Like l linguistic diversity is nil. The way people look is pretty similar. Uh, so yeah, I suppose it's, it's just um, when people ask me where I'm from, I don't always know what to say, you know, like it kind of depends who I'm talking to. That, that makes two of us. That's, that's great. Tell, tell us a little bit about, about the experience of going to school. Did you go to a rural or semi-rural secondary school? What was the art department like? Ah, oh, my goodness. You're asking all the difficult questions at the outset. So um, I went to a high school in a pretty rural town, um, just a normal state school nothing special about it it wasn't top of the range it wasn't bottom of the range we didn't have stabbings we just had the average fights and things that went on but the funny thing about the school was that it was built to accommodate i think maybe five or six hundred kids but we were like getting on for seven or eight hundred kids so in the school it was kind of like physically going through the sausage factory like when the bell went in between classes so yeah that that's where i was but the art department I guess I didn't get on very well there, to be honest, because I kept wanting to do my own thing. And the, there was one teacher in particular that I didn't get on with because whenever, I, like, I was just really determined whenever I was working on a project and I needed to see the thing I was working on through. And the teacher would say to me, you need to move on to the next thing now. And I'd be like, no, I'm going to finish this thing. <laughs> so they, I, I actually think I went to art school in spite of my, my high school art education. I... Yes. I did my own portfolio and applied to art art school, and um, that's how it went. Yeah, and that again makes two of us, because I also didn't get on at all with my secondary school art teachers, and uh, I actually, you know, one day I was locked out of class, and and they, she was asking my colleagues whether they, she should pass me or not, and they said yes, so she gave me a really low grade, just passed, uh, and then eventually entered art school. But then you found yourself. Uh, at Duncan and Jordanston uh, in, in Dundee, which was not that far away from where you grew up, but at the same time, probably was quite m miles away from it in terms of... Yeah. yeah, in that time between leaving school and going to Dundee, I know it's like quite close, but in that time I actually uh, travelled a lot. I spent a lot of time in Sri Lanka and um, a little bit of time in India. But I, I, yeah, I was in Sri Lanka for six months. So um, that was very influential, especially because I was there when the tsunami, 2004 tsunami hit, which was quite an experience. Um, and that really changed things for me because I, I think when I came back to Scotland, I was very much aware of the kind of, uh, the fact that we, we have a, a lot of stability, you know, superficially, we have a lot of stability in this country and people really, I felt like, I just couldn't get back into the mindset of being here and being in Scotland where you can just expect clean water to come out of your tap and you can just expect your buildings not to fall down around you and uh, not to be washed away with no warning. You know, it just seemed like for a young person, I think I was 17 when I did that and it, it was kind of like, it really changed my state of mind. So although I'd only moved from uh, north of Dundee into Dundee to go to art school, I'd kind of gone and done some things in between uh which were which had a big impact on me late later on tsunami included i mean that's that's really fascinating i'm very tempted 
to ask you a question around around that experience, but but maybe maybe too too much, maybe it's too too well, emotional. I think the thing to say is that that experience, and I was lucky not to be caught up in it directly and to be relatively protected, but it's enough to be in an experience where you are absolutely adamant that you're going to die. You don't have to actually die to learn something from that experience. So if you think for even like, even three minutes is enough really, isn't it? But it can completely change your outset, your, your outlook. Um, and, and the thing is that that experience I was lucky to survive. Many of the people I met didn't survive, but um, it just did. It has constantly fed into my work through the years, that experience. Uh, so I guess I kind of join the dots up with other things that I come, that I encounter when I'm researching or when I'm just living. So, sure. yeah. Tell us, um, what, what did you study in Dundee? Uh... Well, technically it was just a, a fine art it was called then I think it's now called contemporary art but it's a course the reason why I went on to that course was because I felt like you could kind of learn and learning about anything was possible within that that boundary so although you were doing I was doing something called fine art any subject was uh, up for grabs essentially and in, in, in terms of what you want to make work about and that seemed really exciting that's one of the reasons why I did an art, I had an art school training because it felt like within an art school uh, degree, you can explore any number of things. You're not really limited. So that really appealed to me at that time. So you basically more or less build your own curriculum as you go along or? Yeah, essentially um, you have a kind of structure of requirements that you meet, but thematically within that and materially with the processes that you choose to engage with in, in how you make your work everything's up for grabs like the only limit is your bank balance and your your mind <laughs> really well there's a few limits realistically I guess you could say that it's a young person's naivety but you have to kind of like uh, protect that it's something that should be nurtured that naivety because it's far too easy to become really cynical <laughs> See, in terms of um, the, the, the themes that you, you, that you were exploring, uh, because that will basically segue into the, into the current exhibition and into the image that you've got um, uh, just sitting behind you there. Tell us a little bit about the, the kind of the themes that you were exploring towards the end of, uh, of your degree. Oh, wow. Um, no one's ever asked me this in an artist talk before because oh, it was so many years ago. Let me think back. Um, at that time, I was very interested in, well, I'm still interested in storytelling, essentially the narratives that we live by. But I, I ended up making sculptures that moved of their own accord, apparently. Like, that's how they appeared. But the way that I did that was that I gathered and repurposed with the help of many people around me who continue to support me today. I gathered and repurposed things like uh, mechanisms from a, from factories and back in back even a decade ago you had to actually make things move mechanically in a way that has changed very much now you can make things move by using digital programming which is really incredibly magical but back then I was actually having to do the mechanical work of joining A to B and B to C and then making that thing come alive so it's a little bit like what I was working on was similar to automata or uh, not exactly puppetry because it was more had it, it appeared to have its own life and its own movement and I was very interested and I still am interested in the gestural aspects of communication so the things I was making came to life and moved in a way that people could implicitly just understand what they were saying <laughs> but without showing you pictures unfortunately my pictures of my degree show are really awful you know like it's really hard to document something well at a degree show um, and I don't even know where they are, but the work was really important to me in terms of developing a set of ideas that I've come back to and, and come back to a little bit in this exhibition. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you, you found yourself uh, in, in, in Edinburgh uh, later on uh, in, in your uh, practice, uh, getting involved with printmaking. Mm. Tell us a little bit about that, please. Well, how did I get involved? I, so, uh, I did I did do a little bit of printmaking at Dundee and I really enjoyed it but it wasn't something that I 
really focused on. When I, um, well, I did a project early on in my career where I made something that was called the Miraculating Machine. What this was, was a commission to make a mobile printing press to travel around the city of Perth. And I, I um, took it around the city. I made this thing and it basically was an elaborate stamp. So it was a, a, a limited edition artist print, but very simple on a piece of paper. And it traveled around the city and I gave out all of these stamps to people. And that in itself was printmaking. So although printmaking in the print studio is something I've done on and off when I've had access to the studio, the, the print does run throughout other parts of my work as well because there's a lot of crossover. So that project is a good example. It was a simple print, but it was still an additioned work that went out to people. Um, yeah, and so I was interested from that perspective. And I think just one of the great things is having access to an amazing print studio and in Edinburgh, they have a good print department and uh, it's something I'd always wanted to explore technically, but you need to set aside quite a lot of time to learn to be a printmaker. <laughs> so yeah, it takes a lot of time and, and, and I had the luxury of that time because I was studying there uh, with those facilities uh, to take the leap and, and study in any printmaking studio is doable and possible, of course, but um, I think when you're doing that alongside other work that you're making, it allows a kind of crossover between different parts of my work. So because I make sculpture and performance, it's great to do that alongside the printmaking as well. Uh, so I learned to do etching there and I learned to do um, screen printing there. And those were great skills to, to have at the end of a degree because Acquiring technical skills is quite hard to do in this day and age. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, you know, <clears throat> going back to the, the, the image uh, behind you, in a, in a previous conversation a few weeks ago, uh, we, we were talking about uh, the story of, of, of Saint Columba that you were narrating to me. Do you want to, to tell us a little bit about that and how that uh, informed a work which is r really you know, directly connected to the image behind you? Yeah, I can do. So that, like I was saying just uh, a few minutes ago, that piece is very important to me. And it's funny that often I feel that my work has to be, re the stories around the pieces of work I make have to be constantly retold to keep them alive. So that is definitely a piece that I keep coming back to as well. But um, yeah, just to, to go back to the beginning with that one, then I was... Uh, invited to do a residency with a group of people by Glasgow School of Art on the island of Rasse up near Skye, just, just off on the edge of Skye. And we were looking at um, the legacy of St. Columba. And I guess I'd been asked because I have been making work about um, the miraculous, essentially, ideas of mirac miracles. Uh, so I think that's why I was invited. You can never really know why someone invites you to something like that, but it's always great when someone does. <laughs> So there I was, and one of the brief, the brief was that, that we had to make work and then present it in a show later. And I ended up being completely fascinated by this um, story that uh, a friend who's also a, a great researcher and academic told me, who um, he told me about um, <clears throat> a story that St. Columba, when he, well, basically St. Columba was banished from Ireland to Scotland over a copyright infringement issue where he copied a codex in a monastery which he didn't have permission to copy and it is a longer story than I'm able to tell here but essentially there were battles over this and blood was shed over this and it was quite grim um, and and it was decided he should be banished and the terms and conditions of his banishment were that he would never set foot on Irish soil again, never set eyes on the Irish people again, and never eat food grown in the soil of Ireland again. So I think those were the three terms. And sometime later after, after he'd established the early Christian church in Scotland, he actually returned to Ireland. But when he returned in order to not break these terms and conditions, he took a clod of earth from Scotland and he walked on the clod of earth. So he never actually set foot on Irish soil. And he also had a blindfold on and was being helped along by some supporters when he came out of his boat. And he also took food with him. So he was eating all of his own food. <laughs> and I just thought, 
that's quite striking that uh, a saint can be so wily. Also, a, a man who's so very important can be so uh, like can do something that kind of undermines his sense of importance. Like you wouldn't catch Donald Trump walking around with a blindfold on, would you? So that really struck me. So with that story in mind, I went out and I attempted to try walking on clods of earth to see what the sensation is like. So a woman helped me to dig clods of turf from her peat bank. And then I um, tied them to my feet with ropes made of grass. And it was all very immediate and of the place I was in. I really like working within the confines of the place that I'm in. And the piece of work that came out of that was very important for me because um, it really captured something like there's a, a really amazing moment when a set of ideas and narratives that I'm kind of thinking about come together in an image and for me it doesn't matter if the image goes alongside the story or if it's read separately I think it's important to have the ability that the, the piece of work can stand on its own um, but I knew when I made that piece that it, it was that like uh, the, the image of the thing has carried on in many ways sometimes with the story attached, sometimes without the story attached. And that's one of the reasons why I do artist talks because I don't often talk about the stories that surround pieces of work. Um, I have to be in, there in person to do that. And I think that's okay because the function of the work is to be itself. Yeah. So, and so that, that does yeah. lead to, to this. Do you want me to talk about how it- Yeah, <laughs> yes, please. Because now we've got, you know, we've got something there which uh, is not turf. It's, no, it looks it's like a bit be, of asphalt, maybe. Yeah, it's hard for you to make out. I did put it up there for reference because one of the really sad things is not being able to do a talk like this in the gallery next to the work. It, it's an added challenge, isn't it? So I put that up there for you tonight. <laughs> but you're right. This is um, it's a piece of tarmac asphalt that, that I think a road maintenance team had just ripped out of. A road that I was traveling down and I just saw it and I took it and then later on that ended I ended up just in my studio just walking around with its tape to the bottom of my foot as you do on the average day at work <laughs> so yeah I was um I think I was just wanting to re-engage with that that idea of walking on a landscape that's precarious I suppose but with this one there's a slightly different element because at that time I was making a lot of work using road maintenance I was using tar um, I was making a big commission with out of tar and I think that that piece kind of indirectly came out of that project as well so uh, part of it is about the fact that we can travel so fast and so far with so little thought you know it's so easy it's so magical that we just whiz along these roads of tarmac so with this action one of my uh hypotheses I guess you could call it is just like what happens when the tarmac is not is hindering you rather than aiding you to go about un unencumbered because I, I do feel that we just take a lot for granted in terms of how magical our movements are and how magical our information flow is it's like everything happens at speed and by magic yeah you often you often talk about um not not taking yourself too seriously as well because it, it looks like a kind of an absurd you know if you're doing something which is creating obstacles in a world which is already difficult uh you know you're creating some kind of absurd situation absurd situation and uh talking about not taking yourself uh, too seriously at the same time um you 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 were questioning you were slightly worried when we talked um uh, to, to, to know wh whether, whether people were uh, ready to laugh at themselves uh, uh, again uh, after such a, a difficult period of the pandemic. Would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I don't think I have the answer to that question. It's still a big question for me because I feel like people in general are feeling very fragile right now, having had a little bit too much time to dwell on our own situations and our own egos. Like I think across the board, people have been grappling with that. And I think in, when I was putting the show at Edinburgh Printmakers together, I had a moment where I just felt a deep sense of uncertainty about that question because um, I have been thinking for a long time about the absurd aspects of the narratives that we live by, particularly when it comes to 
capitalism and capitalist narratives and narr business narratives something else that i'm very interested in is the, the the language that people use as part of business <laughs> and, and again that that links into taking yourself seriously i suppose as well that we take some narratives incredibly seriously in our culture but i just felt that when everyone has had so much time for introspection on a personal level i didn't know how to gauge that question and I still don't like I'm still uh, maybe, testing the water. Maybe it's a good question for the audience. You know, uh, are we ready? Are people that are listening to you, uh, maybe people want to tell us. Uh, I'm going to yeah. write it down as a question in my notebook here because I think you're really right. It's good that you bring that question up again because when I can't answer a question, it's very productive in some ways. Yeah. And are we ready to laugh at ourselves is a good question. I don't know the answer. Um, I mean, in some ways, by being the artist, I'm taking on that burden. It's a little bit like the role of the fool in the tarot deck or the role of the court jester in the court of Henry VIII. You know, that's one of the roles of the artist is to take on that burden of not being taken seriously and all of the difficult dynamics that brings. Yeah. Very good. Um, tell me a little bit, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, we, we, we more or less understand how you're performance, where, where your performance work comes from, but, but then it kind of enters the territory of printmaking. Uh, and, and tell us a little bit about that, uh, that, that process. I mean, how, the, how did that image become a print uh, in terms of its, its actual process rather than the, the conceptual framework? Okay. Well, often when I'm making a piece of work and I'm maybe experimenting or doing something physical, like often I feature in my own work as a means of necessity in order to make something happen or to have something impact on something else. But those processes can be really fleeting. So I often use a camera or document them in some way if the, if the mood is right. <laughs> and then what usually happens is that an image sits with me for a very long time and it keeps coming back and I'm almost haunted by my own image and when I get a serious case of the haunting where like I just can't shake the thing at that point I think yeah it's time to work back into this and see where it goes so when I make a print it's very much like a physical process that allows me to work back into something from a totally new angle so the prints that are in the show, Edinburgh Printmakers, are all um, photo etchings, uh, sorry, screen prints. I've done etchings as well, but these ones are screen prints. And to make them, I basically split the image apart into uh, wavelengths of light. So I end up with a series of stencils that have the information contained in the stencil is based on the wavelength of light that I've separated out of the image that I'm working on. And then I hand make um, inks that are all semi-opaque, they're quite transparent washes of ink. So essentially it's difficult to describe in the abstract, but the image is then remade. I remake the image by hand, building up washes of very pure color on the paper. So the paper is almost like, you could imagine the paper being like pure white light and then the form of the, the thing, which is often quite sculptural, begins to take shape as I layer different transparent colors over the top. Um, so it really is a very fine tuned process that takes a lot of uh, muscular skill and a lot of consistency and focus to produce a consistent result. And there's always a lot of mistakes on the way, which is quite interesting as well. So I'm basically hand making an image that was, was a digital image, but it's very much a handmade object by the time I'm finished with it. And I don't always know what I'm going to get out the other end or, or more, I might be going for something and then partway through the making process, I have to divert and, and look at the outcome that I've produced and think that's actually better than what I was going for. And that's the moment where you decide that's the finished article. Yeah. There's a, there's a straightforward uh, way of doing things, which seems to be never your path. No, nah, not really. Uh, so you, you, you seem to kind of attach heavier things to your feet and to your printmaking processes uh, to some, somehow maybe slow down things and look at them differently. Uh, uh, and then that process of, of slowing down and, and, and making mistakes uh, just forces us 
uh, into encounters that we wouldn't have otherwise. Um, yeah, you're so right about that. Yeah. It, it's it's interesting. I mean, the, the, the mistake there is maybe not something, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, something which is just going to be mobilized in order to create the perfect artwork. But the mistake is something in, in, in of itself, something to be almost desired uh, and, yeah. and enjoyed. And I tell you what the most frustrating thing is, it's when you have a, a mistake that you decide is actually a really excellent development, but th there's nothing you can do to replicate the mistake. A mistake you can't repeat. There's nothing as bad as a mistake you can't repeat. And if you're making an edition of prints and you need the edition to be consistent, of course you have to learn to replicate your mistakes. So then you spend a lot of time trying to work out how you made the mistake in the first place. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm writing that down. There's nothing as bad as a mistake you can't repeat. Yeah, I think that's a good. I think I should write that down too. I'm getting yeah. some good advice for myself here in this talk. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the audience can, uh, can can follow in your steps as well and yeah. make a few more mistakes. And that's maybe the um, what, what's going to what's going to lead us to to smile and laugh at ourselves again. Mm. Uh, is that, that that kind of acceptance? Um, it, it's interesting that you're kind of um, doing things in a way which is, you know, you're, you're kind of operating within printmaking, you know, fine art printmaking, which has a, a very strong tradition. Um, mm -hmm. But you're looking at it through the lens of uh, physical and chemical processes, mm -hmm. uh, and and for that you 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 uh, you got yourself a, a chemistry set uh, at, at the beginning of preparing this exhibition. Uh -huh. uh, tell I us a bit about that. Actually, Edinburgh Printmakers got the chemistry set for me, which I very much appreciated because um, it's the kind of luxury item that I could never justify buying myself, you know. So when some like uh, when it suddenly it was like Edinburgh Printmakers is going to buy you a chemistry set, it was like Christmas came early. So uh, yeah, I think um, the whole time I've been making things as an artist, like the importance of chemical processes is absolutely key. Whatever I'm making, so it can be printmaking or it can be uh, like uh, working with metal or joining things to other things. You just have to really understand how materials react to each other. And that just takes a lot of experience. And I really like the idea of methodically working through all the exercises in the chemistry set in order to understand um, how things react with each other, basically. So I'm only at the beginning. I actually wonder if I have a print here, which I could show you, even though it's a bit dark in my studio. Oh yeah, this one. So this one came from, I'll have to go back a bit so you can see it. This one is from the chemistry set. Ah, uh, wait, upside down. <laughs> Did I show you this before? Um, so this, oh, it's so hard to see. You can almost see it. Here is a mirror uh -huh. and this is, on the, on the side here, you can see my hand holding yeah. some tongs and in the tongs, I'm burning a piece of magnesium. I'm doing this over my cooker at home. Uh -huh. uh, and it's kind of like a performance video, I guess, like very basic action. But I just thought that the burning magnesium is really magical. And uh, I was really taken with that, that short film I made. So it ended up becoming a print on paper. But I'm wondering, like, although this is an addition of prints, it could be really exciting to have a print that contains a strip of magnesium that you can light at your leisure and it burns a circle out of the middle of the print or, or something like that. But, but I think that throughout the experiments in the chemistry set, you can be introduced to so many new materials and new mediums with new possibilities that I would never think of without having the discipline to go through all of the exercises. I actually really want to do that. Like when I get all these deadlines off my chest that I'm working on right now, I'd love to just spend a month just doing all the chemistry set experiments because I've worked some way through the book, but there's a lot more to learn. How many processes more or less uh, does the book? Oh, uh, well, I can't remember because it's actually in the gallery at the moment. So I, I, I would have it to hand, but it's in the show. And I think that there are hundreds, like it's more than a hundred, I think. Uh, and each of those processes is either combining something or watching something react with something else, or sometimes really interestingly, trying to separate out um, chemicals from each other. And that blew my mind. Like the idea that you can make a mixture of chemicals or solution, for example, but then you can precipitate out the original 
salts or the original chemical, whatever it is you're working with, sometimes it is possible to actually retrieve them having done the experiment. And that for some reason really changed my attitude because I always think of things as getting more complicated and more messy. And the idea that you can retrieve something in its pure form is like mind bending. <laughs> What, what was your uh, relationship with the chemistry department at, uh, at that same school? I didn't do chemistry and I really regret it now, but the chemistry teacher was rumored to have false teeth that might supposedly might jump out at you and fall down the back of your blouse in the chemistry department when he leant over you. So I didn't take chemistry for that reason. I actually did physics. <laughs> I learned about satellites orbiting around the world and um, how lights refracted and things like that. But I do really regret not doing chemistry, actually. I wish I'd done it now. I might yet go back to night school and do it because it would be a great thing to have. Alongside the hypnotherapy. Uh, I know, it's got to be a busy year coming up, isn't it? We've already, we were talking before well, we came live see, the about. Thing, the, the, thing with this, the thing with these pandemics is that, you know, we all go back to the things that we always wanted to do and never had the time to. and start taking them seriously. Uh, yeah, and I'm also thinking on that, what you're saying there, I'm also thinking like, is it something you can do as an artist? Is it something you can do to like retrain in another profession as a work of art in its own yes, right? Like, I would say so. So if I want to train as a hypnotherapist, maybe that's an artwork. Or if I want to train as a lawyer, maybe that's an artwork that I do four, four years of law, two years of law degree. Uh, but then I wonder like, at what stage does the artwork swallow you up? That's the question. <laughs> like, at what point do you stop being the artist and it's become a lawyer? It's already swallowing you up, Jessica. <laughs> Tell me a little bit. You, you, when we spoke a while back, you, you know, this is this is on a tangent, but you, you spoke, uh, you spoke about speculative bubbles. Oh yeah, yeah, we did talk about that, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that was Charles Mackay and. Uh, oh yes, I've got the book here. This book has been very influential. It's um, yeah, it's quite a scathing book written by a very scathing man who's pretty good at uh, ripping other people to shreds. But <laughs> um, it's basically a, a a compilation of all of the perceived, all of the follies, all of the the wrong trees that people have barked up over history, and all of the. Uh, kind of I mean just to give you a, I'll just yeah this book was quite influential for me for for many years actually it's got a section on modern prophecies um the Mississippi scheme like Ponzi schemes witchcraft alchemy all the things that people love to write off and laugh about but one one section is about um speculation and that really interests me so we're according to economists we're living right now in the everything bubble which could burst at any time uh, but essentially I think speculation is a subject that ties into my interest in the narratives that we live by and how powerful they are so there have been many points in history where people have done absolutely insane and illogical things in the service of profiting through speculation and the I was talking to you Nuno about the uh, tulip mania in the Netherlands in the 18th century, I think it was, could be 17th, um, where tulips became so valuable that people were just trading their entire livelihoods on one bulb. And uh, obviously the price of a tulip went up and up and up and became unaffordable for most people, but eventually it collapsed overnight and people were just ruined. People who had put everything into buying and selling large amounts of tulips just lost everything that they had and that really fascinates me because like a tulip's a really powerful just like a simple flower like what's so special about it like we can buy tulips really easily today but they were selling for ridiculous amounts of money at that time you could, you could uh, create the parallel between uh, tulip speculation and, and art speculation in terms of markets and so on, but we're not going to we're not going to go down that. I'm doing that, another that. lecture on that actually. <laughs> I've been hired to do a lecture on that, but it's not this one. It's a different lecture. Listen, so, you, I was I'm just going to ask you uh, about your future plans, so that segues into that. Uh, yeah. 
my future plans. I'm actually working through a lot of projects right now. So um, the pandemic caused a lot of piece, a lot of things I was working on to be cancelled or postponed. And what's happened is that everybody wanted to press go at once. Like absolutely everyone's got their finger on the go button. And I'm just on a total treadmill trying to meet all of the different commitments. So I'm actually, my plan is to have a holiday and read a book. <laughs> I did that last week. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> of course. Like I'm going to take some time off and have a holiday because I haven't really had a holiday for a very, very long time. Um, and then I'll think about more long-term plans or whether to start my own Ponzi scheme or something. I don't know what the future yeah. could hold. <laughs> very good. I mean, we're, we're all, all going to be very, very curious uh, about what, what, what you're up to next. I think uh, it's, it's totally deserved, you know, time, some time off, recharge batteries, and maybe go somewhere sunny for a bit, a week or something. And, Wow, I can't Readable. imagine that. I can't imagine some going somewhere sunny for a wee bit. That would be great, wouldn't it? I'll see if I can do it. <laughs> I was, you know, swimming in the sea after many months oh. last week in the Algarve, and nobody else was in the water. Not many people were in the water, but uh, I, I didn't really care. And it was, uh, it was, it was a fantastic experience of relaxation. Truly amazing. Yeah. I'm so happy that you made it there. It sounds truly amazing. It was a, it was a great uh, a, a great street. Uh, anyway, um, we, we're going to welcome uh, Janet back uh, to the conversation. It's been fascinating uh, talking to you, uh, Jessica. Yeah, thanks for your questions, and it's always great to have a chat. Like uh, it's kind of interesting to reflect on the work because when you're in the process of making it, you don't always get the reflection time. So it's a really nice thing to do with the help of someone like you. So thanks. <laughs> Janet? Yeah, I'm here and somebody needs to bring me back in. There we go. Hi. That was really interesting. And I mean, there's so much to think about in all of the words that you've been using. Um, just you, 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 you are in a city which is hosting COP26 just now, and we're all thinking about what, what sustainability means and, and, and what we need to do as a human race to be able to protect our environment. Um, and you made me think about, and your story about tulips and trophies made me think about our continued strong desire to consume things as human beings. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to stop? Do you think the messaging that's coming out of COP and other platforms like COP will eventually persuade people to change that habit? Or do you think post-pandemic people are going to want to buy more and more and more just because they can? Mm, that's a really good question. And there's so many layers to possible answers that um, could go many directions, but there's, I have a few thoughts on that. One is um, uh, that, I think living in, like spending a lot of time in Glasgow, it's quite a poor city by comparison with other cities in the UK potentially, or you know, within the particular standard of how Glasgow might be measured. And one thing that I see is that there are many, many people that just don't have the capacity to make changes that are essentially middle-class wealthy choices that some people can afford to make and some people can't. And the same would go for people living in the countries that are suffering from climate change versus the countries that have had a much bigger part in causing climate change. And so I think one of the things I really take issue with is like the individual, the individualistic nature of the responsibilities that we are uh, encountering, that we do have a responsibility to change. But I also think that it's um, a little bit, it's, it's, kind of very unfair that those responsibilities have become individualized. So I think that um, addressing some aspects of our uh, individual sense of self-construction, that's very much tied into consumerism, but also the climate change proposals that we have seen up to this point rely on individuals taking a huge amount of burden on their own shoulders. And I think what we're seeing is we're at a point where we're seeing that that is working. And we can't really we can't really change this as individuals. You can do your recycling, you can stop driving, you can stop flying, um, but it's not enough to make the difference that we need to see. And I think that that's quite painfully obvious across Glasgow at the moment. So I hate to say it, but the general prognosis is that um, 
all the positive marches are happening next weekend where people are going out and they're saying, yeah, we can do this, we can change, we can change things. And then the weekend after, there's another set of marches planned for those who anticipate that the thing is not going to produce the results that we need in order to make the changes that we need. So in terms of the activists who are working towards stuff here, there's different camps and uh, there's one camp that says that we can't afford to depress people into apathy we can't afford for people to feel so upset and sad about what's happening that they can't make any positive change but then there's another camp that's kind of saying no things are really bad uh, and people should know just how bad they are but it's an interesting tussle between those ethical dilemmas and yeah it just is a question with so many levels and so many people are just bit worn out and run down because they're trying to survive on a daily basis and I think that's quite hard to see when we need to come together beyond those barriers but but really my personal opinion is that inequality and wealth inequality is really the driving force that that is causing that situation. Indeed and I suppose um, and there's such a lot of difficult difficult questions and personal choices that people will have to make in the future um, and, you know, I guess sort of two big issues relate to eating meat and traveling large distances across the world, um, mm. both of which um, many people at this stage just want to turn their head away from. I'm interested in both of your views, I suppose, in oh, relation to those two topics. I just have one thing that I want to say as well um, on that, which I forgot to say in my last answer, is... In terms of consumerism, there's something very interesting about making things, essentially. So obviously, being an artist, you consume a certain amount of resources. But my feeling being an artist is that if you have an understanding of what's actually required to make something physical in the real world, it is easier to see what you're consuming. It's easier to know how much energy. It's easier to quantify things. But for a lot of people, here in the West, we have no concept of how to make something that works from scratch. And I think that that's qu quite key as well in terms of like, we're always thinking about particular consumer choices we can uh, do differently, like the choice to travel differently or to eat differently. But, but essentially the understanding of how things are made that we require to live is somewhat lacking. <laughs> and so, um, having devoted many years to making things I do believe that that's uh quite important so I just want to add that as well <laughs> yeah and today I was talking to Alistair Clark in the studio about this the slowness of print making uh and the fact that it is a form that takes time and um and you have to commit to that um along with the cleaning afterwards um but you know I guess that's a good, I, I see that as a good thing, that it, it just by its very nature, the practice of printmaking requires you to slow down and be present in yourself and reflect and, and, and make choices and go forwards and backwards, um, which has got to be healthy for us, hasn't it, in, 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 in terms of, of how we exist in our bodies. Yeah. It is if you discount the chemicals you're exposed to. For sure. <laughs> I don't know if you want it to say something, Nuno. You know, I've been I've been speaking a lot. <laughs> no, I you know I was just thinking about the, the question of traveling and uh, it's connected to the idea of slowing down. Um, you know, I've been taking trains here within the Iberian Peninsula. And it's fantastic. You know, it's just so much more comfortable and but it takes longer and. Uh, it, it can also be a bit more expensive, but those are the kind of the changes that if we can, you know, we have to be will, willing to do. Um, you know, before we would just jump in a flight somewhere without really thinking about it. Uh, you know, we just have to, to to start being more considered. But I take the same position as Jessica. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say that this is a question of individual responsibility only. I think that um, it, it's a question of political leadership. Politi you know, politicians are leading us. I mean, I'm not a politician. I, you know, uh, we, none of us are, you know, are, are politicians, but polit politicians are leading us now. And, um, and and they've been aware of this for, for a while. I mean, in 2015, uh, you read this part of my biography that we organized Camp Breakdown uh, in Lumsden. And Camp Breakdown was a group of about 40 people that got together for 11 days to try to think about what the post-oil world would look like. 
And so we did that by slowing down our processes and making things from cooking together, telling stories around the fire, making theater, uh, uh, and, and, and really being considerate in terms of, of the, the, the resources that, that we were um, using. Six years later, you know, I was slightly optimistic. And, you know, it was, it was a marginal conversation, but, but, you know, and now it's a mainstream conversation. It's part of every uh, newspaper. I mean, The Guardian has been covering, uh, you know, COP26 uh, in depth and so on. Uh, the politicians know about it. Uh, they know what we need to do, both in terms of pandemics and in terms of climate breakdown, but they seem to have uh, no power over large corporations. Uh, Varoufakis uh, was talking about um, us having, you know, capitalism has, has, has come to an end. He's, he's writing a book about that, uh, um, which I, you know, which I would uh, love to read when it comes out. But he basically says that, you know, the left uh, is very interested uh, in, in bringing down capitalism, but, but it's, 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 it's got there too late because capitalism kind of, you know, disappeared by itself. And what brought it down was this notion of techno feudalism, where uh, you know when you enter something like Facebook, um, you're basically entering something that's been uh, programmed and coded by one person, uh, you know, around their own ideas of what that space should be. And, and if we transfer that metaphorically into a physical space of the city, uh, you would walk about uh, here in Madrid, and everything, uh, uh, all the buildings, all the shops, all the supermarkets, all the nightclubs, uh, all the museums belong to one person. And that is the idea of feudalism. Uh, now, this guy is stronger than many governments. He's richer than many governments. So how are our political leadership, uh, how is our, our political leadership going to have uh, um, uh, the, the power to change things, to, you know, to, 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 to bring about uh, an, another world order? How can communities, how can artists, how can art organizations uh, uh, self-organize and actually have a, a meaningful impact uh, uh, you know, pushing back what he calls techno feudalism. That's a massive question that I, I make no uh, intention of even attempting to to, to answer. But uh, I think that's one of the, the questions that should be discussed at the moment uh, in the context of COP26. Yeah, I want to discuss that more as well because it's an incredibly frustrating situation to be trapped within, isn't it? Techno feudalism, but but we're all complicit and we're all more complicit post pandemic. So I'm, if you ever want to talk about that, I'm up for having a chat. Well, I'm, going to, I'm going to plug something tomorrow at uh, uh, six o'clock. I think it's at uh, Peacock and the Worm, John Jordan, Jay Jordan uh, is going to be launching a book, uh, which, which, which is very much a book of strategies uh, against uh, the uh, imposition of an airport in a part of, of France. Um, so the project is called ZAD. And, uh, and, and they're publishing the book tomorrow. Well, they, they, they're launching the book tomorrow in Aberdeen uh, uh, at, at, at six o'clock. I haven't read the book. I'm looking forward. It's being presented uh, within uh, the context of COP26. I think that they're doing stuff also in Glasgow. Uh, John Jordan is doing stuff also in Glasgow. And uh, yeah, let's, let's arrange some time and, and have this conversation because this is you know, as important as anything we can, we can discuss at the moment, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're getting into the territory of why the arts matter to our world. Um, and it, Jessica, you said at the start that within an art school degree, you can explore any number of things. You're not really limited, which is a phenomenal opportunity for a young person to be able to mine their, their self and their environment and their, their, their network um, and, and, and form views and, and perspectives in terms of how they, they react to that they're, that they're reacting to their past and present and future. Um, what, what you, you've talked a lot about what's important to you in your work and your practice, both of you, but why in your view are the arts important to our world and particularly printmaking as a form? Mm. Shall I go first? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think in terms of the arts being important, then my feeling around that is that you can't have, you can't easily have resilience if you don't have contact with your own creativity. And so the role of art, as far as I'm concerned, is, is to either help people, or to help people make contact with their creative side from a very wide, broad brush 
explanation. That's what I would say. And that's why it's very, very important because people can get through some very, very difficult situations if they have that core of resilience. But if there is no resilience, then you're just toppled over at the next breeze sort of thing. So um, that's, that's my take on why art in general is important, be it music, be it the visual arts, be it theatre. It's, it's a chance to connect with yourself in, in a space which is non, uh, not directed in the way that a lot of verbal or getting into, I'm trying to keep it simple. I'll maybe not go into it because it's a big question, but um, that's, that's the very simple answer. And in terms of printmaking, what I think is very interesting about printmaking is that it's, um, it's got such an incredible history. And when print was first used, it was completely groundbreaking. And for me, I often think about how, for example, Roman coins were issued that had the face of the emperor on the coin. It was used as a method of kind of circulating propaganda, but also subjugating a, a people um, in the, on the fringes of their empire. But, but just think how amazing it was when people saw for the first time things that were exact copies of themselves. Like that, was, that must have been incredible to have something that was exactly the same as something else. But now we take that completely for granted and now printmakers are having to make additions in order to say, no, this isn't like everything else. There's only 10 of these available. <laughs> and I just think the fact that print has had such a long history and has basically evolved in order to situate itself in and against whatever the mainstream culture is, is really, really interesting. So that's maybe where I'll stop with, with print because you could talk about it for a long time. But Nuno, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I always, uh, I always have thoughts on things that are not, 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 not always very interesting. Um, uh, in, in relation to, to the art, you know, I, you're, you're talking about connection to creativity, and, and I would, I would say, to, you know, it, it's a connection with the kind of the, with with the animal inside you, or with, with, with your animal part. You know, I would say that artists have a high percentage of that element that gets out through the use of voice. Grrr, letterism, letters, sounds, performance, processes, hammering things. Uh, so, so I think that that is a great way of connecting to that to, to that side, uh, uh, you know, to the less less rational side. Um, on on one hand, the other, on the other hand, is also a way of um, uh, disregarding, disputing. Uh, you know, official cultures and official stories and histories by 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 bringing underground and subversive ones uh, to to the to the to the fore. Brilliant. So, thank you so much to both of you and for your incredibly articulate articulate. I can't even say the word perspectives um, on many things. Uh, thank you, Jess, for all of your stories. Uh, and Nuna for your wisdom. Um, we're going to do a little walk around your exhibition with a video camera this week um, and we're going to show it to our audience next week on the Art of Printmaking which will be at five o'clock next Wednesday um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that um, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to join us either at five next week and, and, and watch and, and or, or watch it afterwards on YouTube where it'll be um, posted up uploaded. Um, I should name check the artist behind me before I finish. So that's, this work is Callum by Callum Colvin. Uh, he was born in Glasgow, a Scottish artist whose work combines photography, painting and installation. Who also, it often deals with issues of Scottish identity and cultures and within the history of art. So, um, and um, yes, yeah, so really looking forward to next week in the art of printmaking. Big, big thank you to both of you for taking part this evening. And um, I, shall, I shall look forward to what comes next uh, in relation to both of your pursuits. So thank you. Thank you very much to our audience for joining us.